This is the video for the standard level content on D4.1, Natural Selection. In previous topics, you may have heard of Lamarckism or that passing down of acquired traits. Um, the thought of evolution by natural selection as proposed by Darwin represents a huge shift um, in our paradigm for biology and our way of thinking about how and why things change. So what we do know is that natural selection is continuous. That means that it's always happening and it's responsible for the biodiversity on earth. In this video, we'll be going more into depth about the four requirements for natural selection to take place. Variation is one of the requirements for natural selection, and there are three main sources of variation in populations. Mutations can occur in any organism and do, and this creates new alleles, new versions of genes. Meiosis and sexual reproduction are specific to sexually reproducing organisms. Meiosis produces new combinations of alleles through things like crossing over and um, random orientation, that independent assortment. And then sexual reproduction is that combination or um, fertilization of gametes that can be from a variety, almost infinitesimal number of combinations. This is a huge advantage for sexually reproducing organisms, especially in changing environments. Asexually reproducing organisms only have mutation to provide variation, and it may be that those variations aren't in the line or advantageous with the environment as it changes. Sexually reproducing organisms, however, have a much greater degree of variation, which can definitely be a benefit in changing environments. An overproduction of offspring is also a requirement for natural selection. So what does overproduction mean? It means that more offspring are produced than will ever be supported by the environment. More offspring will pr be produced than will survive to reproductive age to pass along their own genes. And this means that there's really a competition for resources. And we say intraspecific competition, competition within a species that's covered in a different topic. This could be because there's limitations for space or resources or mating uh, availability. And these are the things that determine the carrying capacity for a population, okay? So again, competition is a very important factor for natural selection because it sets up some individuals to be more uh, fit for their environment than others in that population. In an organism's environment, there are several abiotic factors that act as selection pressures, things that are driving natural selection. Abiotic meaning non-living, and they can either be classified as density independent or density dependent. Density independent means that it does not rely on the density of the population, or another way of thinking of this is that it doesn't really matter what the population is um, or how densely um, populated an area is. These factors will drive natural selection processes all the same. So this is something like temperature or national natural disasters, things in the environment like the salinity of the soil, okay, that we can see that here some abiotic factors like let's say temperature is going to drive natural selection and it doesn't matter whether there are other organisms close by or not. Density dependent factors do rely on the density of the population, how many of them are living in a space at a time. So it could be the availability of minerals in a soil or access to water. You can imagine where if I have a greater density of population, these abiotic factors are going to be more and more important. These selection pressures are going to give some individuals an advantages, okay? So certain individuals with certain variations are going to have advantages in their environment due to either density independent or density dependent factors. And it all comes back to that competition. So let's go ahead and define that intraspecific competition. Intra means within. This is competition within a species. 
Another word that you'll hear me say a lot is fitness. Fitness does not mean how fast you can run or how much weight you can lift. Fitness refers to heritable, that's genetic, heritable factors that influence survival or reproduction within an ecological niche. So I like to think about fitness as the degree to which our genetic components give us an advantage in either survival or reproduction. The greater the fitness, the higher the chance uh, that an organism survives. So greater fitness will lead to longer survival or more probable survival and more probability of reproducing, which means more passing along of its genes, which means a greater contribution to the gene pool. It's important to note that just because you have a greater uh, degree of fitness does not guarantee survival or reproduction or passing along of those genes. It's just a more likely probability. Now, one of the reasons that we focus on heritability so much for uh, that definition of fitness is because acquired traits, although they can help an individual survive and reproduce, they won't be passed down to the offspring. That was that Lamarckism that we have already um, used much evidence to falsify, right? So these acquired traits, although they are helpful to an individual, don't change the DNA-based sequence in the gametes in those sex cells, so they won't be passed along to that next generation. Evolutionary change requires heritability. So to put it in the context of humans, you may um, acquire a trait like a tattoo that either helps you, it gives you an advantage in either survival or reproduction. But if you were to reproduce, your offspring would not have that tattoo evolutionary change happens on a population level, not an individual level. And so this really requires that that fit, that idea of fitness relates back to our genes, back to that concept of heritability. Now, abiotic factors like temperature and soil minerals are very important selection pressures, but so is sexual selection. So this is an example of a biotic factor, right? Sexual selection is the process of identifying and choosing potential mates that are best adapted, okay? And that means that they're more likely to produce offspring that are also well adapted. So remember, when we talked about fitness, it's the degree to which your heritable traits give you an advantage in either survival or reproduction. So with this reproduction bit of that definition, what we're really talking about are heritable traits that give you an advantage in this sexual selection process. These are the things that drive courtship behaviors. So in this bird, you're going to see this really fantastic plumage or feathers. And these feathers are a genetic trait um, that definitely give this organism an advantage in sexual selection. During its mating or courtship process, it is going to show off those feathers. So that's a behavior driven um, towards sexual selection. So this bird of paradise is a great example of that. These exaggerated traits like these crazy feathers or this wild coloration, these are uh, results of successful courtship, okay? So these are the things, the traits that must have been selected by potential mates and they become more and more exaggerated um, as these individuals with those traits have advantages in sexual selection processes and pass along those heritable characteristics more often. One of the case studies that you should be familiar with and definitely look further into are John Indler's experiments with these fishes called guppies. And guppies have a very wide array of coloration. Females preferred colored males. That's part of the sexual selection process. 
But unfortunately, a high degree of coloration makes the males more vulnerable to predators. So which circumstances are going to favor coloration versus no coloration? And what John Endler found was that in areas of a stream where there is a high level of predators or a high population of predators, males tended to be less colorful, that that was the selective pressure that was driving natural selection. However, in areas where there were very few predators, males tended to be very colorful. So in those areas, it was really the sexual selection um, that was driving the changes in that population. And so he did a series of controlled experiments on predator effectiveness um, and putting males from one stream into another. This is a great opportunity for you to look into that and to interpret some data regarding coloration so that you have a better idea about how natural selection plays out in real examples.